Good morning. I can't believe um, people have actually come indoors on the first sunny Saturday um, since Halloween. Um, but welcome, um, welcome to Portland State. Um, I'm, I'm Wendy Willis. I'm the director of Oregon's Kitchen Table and will sort of just be guiding us through the day today. Um, I, before we get started, I'm going to um, introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Nusad Ahmed, who's going to do the land, uh, PSU's land acknowledgement for us. Good morning, everyone. So Portland State University is located in the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon, in Multnomah County. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala, Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalpuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Nusat. So we're going to try to do mix and mingle, which people very well mix and mingle, but they only they don't seem to mix. They just seem to mingle. So we're going to try it again. Um, so the prompt for today, which you'll see up there, um, is what is your big hope for Portland? So here's how it works. The music goes on. Sarah turns the music on. And then when the music stops, you find a buddy. You talk about that. Um, that prompt, and when the music goes back on, you move on um, to the next. You move on until it stops, and you and you get to um, mix and mingle with someone else. So, try to at least talk to two people. Like we're, our, our our bar is low. Like everybody's only talking to one person because they get so excited. So let's try at least to talk to two people today. So um, enjoy yourself, Sarah. You did. People did really well today. Um, thanks for um, thanks for indulging us and for um, spending some time uh, visiting with one another. So um, I know this is a this is a this meeting is this rolling meeting uh, has its um, beautiful benefits that we've been in different places, but it means that um, everyone is not in the same place at the same time. So in order to sort of catch us up from that, um, we're going to let, there's a whole bunch of people that are behind this meeting, and many of them are going to introduce themselves to you today, and they're going to just give a reflection from yesterday, so we can get yesterday into this room today. So, um, you know, OKT team, CPS team, and city team, come, uh, if you want to come forward and offer uh, your name and uh, your pronouns, where, who, who you're with, and your reflection from yesterday. Diane? Good morning, everybody. My name is Diane O'Day, and um, I work for the Center for Public Service as a graduate research assistant. Um, my pronouns are she and hers. I would say that something that I've been reflecting on from yesterday has been the importance of persistence. Progress is not always linear, uh, but progress does happen, and it takes hard work, patience, and persistence. Good morning, everyone. Um, Perla Sitkov from Office of Community and Civic Life. I'm actually just gonna take a moment and ask if we can all sort of get up and move maybe towards the, the center or the front so that we've, we're kind of together and more filled um, in the front so we, the speakers feel like there's a stronger community up front. Thank you. Um, I've learned so much in the past two days and to be honest, I'm not sure if this was yesterday or the day before, but I think it was something that was um, woven out throughout all the conversations. Um, and that is the intentionality about mindset when you're doing engagement, going into a community and um, instead of going in with your assumptions, um, going in with uh, and, and really coming in with the idea of what is working well and what you believe is working well with that community and that really builds a lot of, I think, trust and a good re starting relationship when you're doing engagement. Thank you. 
Good morning, I'm Sarah Giles. I work uh, with Wendy at Oregon's Kitchen Table. And uh, at the end of the day yesterday, as we were cleaning up, uh, Damon and Alicia Howard, who was our, our host at June Key Delta Center, and I were chatting on the front steps. And Alicia said two things uh, about community engagement to me that uh, have been sitting with me in that, um, was the importance of connection along with caring for each other and that if we're not connected we can't care for each other in the way we need to be and that that is something for her that is really important with community engagement and that really reigned true for me too. So, Megan? Good morning, I'm Megan. I'm with the Oregon's Kitchen Table team and I'm also going to reflect on something that Alicia, one of our panelists from yesterday, shared. She talked about the importance of repairing harm before we can engage with community, and I think that's something really important to keep in the forefront of our minds. Hi, I'm Shelby Williams, pronoun she, they. I'm with the Office of Community and Civic Life. Uh, one of our panelists from yesterday, Mr. Ed Washington, spoke about building the future by engaging youth voices. And I think that is something incredibly important because kids are smart. We don't give them enough credit, kids are smart. And there are issues in the world that are increasingly affecting them, gun violence, gender affirming healthcare, reproductive healthcare education, things like these, that the youth are leading on. They're walking out of their classes, they're telling us what they need and we're not listening. We're not making the changes that they wanna see. And we have the power to. We can make those changes now before they have to wait 20 years to make those changes for themselves. And we owe it to them to build pathways t to allow them to do that and to listen to them and actually lead or follow where they lead because they are our future. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm Rosalind Owen uh, with Oregon's Kitchen Table. And one of the things, I mean, I liked all the panels we've had, but yesterday at June Key Delta Center, the second panel of Ed, Alicia, and Shikoya, Sh I really liked how the generations um, expressed what they thought community engagement was and how it affected their community, and I really, really enjoyed that session. Thanks, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Margaret Banny, and I'm a, a faculty member at Portland State University and with the Center for Public Service. We're part of the uh, note-taking, I'm calling also meaning-making team that will help develop the summary report for these meetings. So one thing that really struck me about yesterday was the importance of place as a way to connect communities. So one thing one of the speakers talked about was when we destroy places, we're also destroying communities that have built up around those places. And so for me, that was kind of a powerful connection about how, how place matters. Uh, and and it, it also occurs to me the place that we are in right now matters. And so um, the sort of attendance to how we think about land use and land use decisions have all these really important implications, I think, for how we connect um, and, and engage. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Nuzat Ahmed, pronouns she, her, hers. Uh, I work for National Policy Consensus Center, and uh, of course, Oregon Kitchen Table, I'm helping, and soon to be a student again. Um, for me, the takeaway that yesterday, Philippi was mentioning that active listening is a show of true love, and one of my key takeaways after listening to that, when I was connecting all the dots, uh, as my previous um, colleagues were mentioning, that listening can build the trust, start building the communications, and that gives hope for me, along with these other comments, that together we can solve the problems. I feel the belongingness and togetherness together, and that's how the community engagement is so important to bring a sustainable policy. Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome. I'm Damon and I am a project consultant with Oregon's Kitchen Table. 
Yesterday, what really stood out to me, there's a lot of things, and I'm looking at some of the many, many themes that came up, um, but I'll highlight two that really stood out to me. Um, when Dr. Carboni, um, who's with us today, spoke about the, that the, the way that we as a society sometimes value expertise in our society is not always a healthy one. So along those lines, ensuring that lived experiences alongside what we consider technical or professional experiences is, is held together in terms of how do we collectivize that information and um, what we need to know to move forward together as a society. Um, and also one of our speakers yesterday used the term that I loved, the continuum of engagement. So it's not just certain times a year. It's not just when it's in the budget <laughs> cycle. And it's not just because someone told you to. It's, there's a continuum. Good morning, Kim Hack Davidson, she, her pronouns. I'm with the Oregon Kitchen Table. I'm a graduate student here at PSU um, and helping with note taking. I think it was just really powerful to be at the June Key Delta Center um, and have three black Portlanders share their stories. And the oldest was 87. I don't know how old the youngest was, um, but just to hear their experiences. Um, and Mr. Um, Ed Washington, he actually lived at Vanport. Um, and I think he was five years old when the, the horrific floods came. But he said that that town was built quick, 40,000 housing units in a short span and you know he said when there's a will there's a way and he said that was quality housing quality community spaces so it's like if we have that collective um, effort we have already shown that we can make it happen thanks thanks Kim and thanks everybody um, as you can see you know there's uh, various things have been heard and said the last few days it's all taped so you can see it um, later if you want to but you also can talk to your neighbors and, um, and just to, you know, during lunch, during reflection time, um, just to hear people's experiences over the last few days. So I'm, we're really glad you're here. Um, we're gonna invite our, um, our visitors for, for just to give a little bit of reflection. Um, Julia Bryant and Felipe, if you don't mind joining us here. Um, the prompt today is, today is kind of our our futures day, we're thinking about um, what Portland can be in the future. So we've asked um, each of them, if you don't mind introducing yourself again for folks who haven't met you yet, and then um, what, you th what your thoughts are about the futures of community engagement. And I'm not running away, I'm actually going to get my water bottle, so I'm not in a huff. So I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so I'm Julia Carboni. I am a professor at the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, where I also direct a program uh, called Citizenship and Civic Engagement. Uh, and I'm a research director for collaborative governance in a research institute called PARC. Over the summer, I'll be moving to Seattle, so I'll be joining you in the Pacific Northwest um, to run the Ruckles House Center. Uh, at, uh, thank you, um, which is a partnership between Washington State and University of Washington um, to support collaborative policy making and public engagement. And so, you know, I think that when I think about the future of public engagement uh, here in Portland or really anywhere, what I would like to see if I'm imagining a brighter future is really this sort of letting go of what is and embracing what can be. And one of the things that's notable about Portland is that you guys have overhauled your city government in rapid time. I've never seen anything move uh, that big or that fast. So you already have the capacity here uh, to make change. And so when I say let go of what is and embrace what can be, um, I really mean center making progress over holding on to power, right? And so a lot of public engagement is really centered on particular actors, whether they're government or community associations or whatever the actor is, maintaining the power that they hold um, while also engaging with others. So you can come in my sandbox, but it's still my sandbox. And so what I would love to see um, is this focus on authentic engagement, going to where people are, and centering the engagement process, uh, centering solution making over you know, um, problem seeking, 
and really uh, having an authentic and collaborative process that decenters power and privilege and instead says, you know, we all have experience and we can work together uh, toward whatever goal we're pursuing um, and, and letting go of egos. So really just decentering power and privilege and embracing uh, authentic engagement versus holding on to power centers. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Hi, uh, Bryna Helfer. Uh, I'm, I live in Arlington County, Virginia. Um, we're in close proximity to Washington, D.C. Uh, for those of you who weren't with us earlier, we're, we're, we're geographically small. Uh, we're 26 square miles. We have 237,000 people, so smaller than Portland. But um, we look like a city, walk like a city, talk like a city, but we're a county. Um, but we provide all the services that... that, that city government does. Um, and so I am the assistant county manager. I lead public engagement and communications for the county. I sit on the cabinet and the executive leadership team. And uh, we have communication and public engagement um, teams uh, in all of our departments, which I think are equivalent to your bureaus. Uh, and I think, you know, in talking with many of you and others over the last several days, um, I've learned a lot being here, by the way. And it's really, I mean, so... Um, just great when community comes out, you know, so thank you for that and thanks for your hospitality. But I guess as I think about um, your journey and my, our journey, um, they're not unsimilar. And so really taking a look, um, and I think this builds a little bit on what you were saying, Julia, is like what's working really well? You guys do so much in the engagement space that works really, really well. And sometimes it's hard to just step back and acknowledge that and appreciate that, um, and then identify where there's opportunities to strengthen it. Um, and some of it, um, for those of you who work in government, it's a, uh, this is just an observation, um, you know, making it easier for community members to understand where there's opportunities to connect with their government. Um, you know, I often say this, like it's not um, a resident's responsibility to understand how government works. It's our responsibility to make it easier to access their government. And, um, and so, you know, just thinking about how to do that. And then, um, you know, where are there opportunities to leverage coordination across departments? Um, Darlene and I were talking about this. You know, there are some issues that just, can't, you know, a little bit of silo busting around the coordination of engagement and communication um, so that, um, you know, working hand in hand to engage right people. And then we talked a lot about intentionality over the last two days and, you know, really identifying who your stakeholders are and making sure that they understand why they might care about coming with their government and recognizing that, you know, government can be big, scary, um, like hairy, like, you know, like spider, uh, but we're not, we're, we're people, um, but you know, not everyone you know is really comfortable like picking up the phone or showing up at a meeting or speaking up at a meeting or you know just so how do we as government um, kind of be radically welcoming to uh, allow people to um, be in that space? So, thank you. I like that about. The government being hairy. Not, not being a spider. <laughs> That's a great metaphor. Uh, my name is Felipe Rey. I am from, from Colombia, from Bogota. I'm a professor of public law at uh, Universidad Javeriana, and I am also the founder of uh, EDIMOS, which is an organization that works on deliberative democracy projects in, in Latin America. Well, I, I, will, I will answer. It's, it's a question about, Wendy, it's a question about future. So I will, I will mention three or four characteristics that I think that that future might look like. The first one is future-oriented. So I think that um, the public engagement in this century has to think more about other kind of subjects, for example, future generations. For example, animals, for example, nature. So in some sort of way, I think that in, the, in this entry, we have to go from a perspective of our interest to their interest to start thinking about 
other other subjects. I, I think that that is very important, and it's very important for for cities, for cities in the in the twenty first century. The second characteristic I would mention is a more um, collaborative kind of engagement. I think that w the best thing that governments can do is to listen to citizens because governments they normally or very frequently they don't know all the answers because they are human. That's the reason they are human. So citizens have a lot of experience that as someone said yesterday is in other words expertise. It's a form of exp experience is expertise in another in another uh, word. The third characteristic I would mention is I, I dream with an engagement that is uh, less extractive in some sort of way and more deliberative. So it's not just about, for example, collecting ideas of gi or give me your opinion in my web or something like that. It's actually engaging in a conversation and giving arguments or, and giving explanations. Many times we can't get what we want and that's, that's normal and that's perfectly okay. But we expect from the administration an explanation of why not. And maybe we'll be happy with an explanation. That's all that we wait for. A good explanation about why we didn't have what, what, we, what we asked for. And the fourth characteristic I would mention, Wendy, is an innovative kind of public engagement. So I think that we need to use other forms, other instruments. We have to open other kind of spaces. In this wonderful meeting, we have heard about, for example, participatory budgeting and also uh, citizens assemblies. And I, I would like to very briefly mention the great work that Healthy Democracy is doing in Oregon in, in, this, in this field. They are really pioneers at a global level uh, in, in this kind of, of, of engagement. So I think that we need to be innovative. I think that we need to try other forms of um, uh, deliberation. And the last thing I will say, the last thing I will say is that engagement has to be also more tolerant. Uh, yesterday I, hear, I heard a beautiful um, phrase from Alice, I think. She said something like, my Portland was very black. She was talking about her own story, about her own history. My Portland was very black. Well, there are as many Portlands as citizens because each citizen has a different view, a different story about the city. So when you are aware of that, you, you say, okay, that person is not that he's a bad person, is not that he thinks very different to me, it's just that, that her story is completely different to mine. And that is very helpful to help to build a dialogue. Be aware of the different stories of life and the different views of the city that it, each person has. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Felipe. Before I, but now there's bonus questions. <laughs> so um, actually, yesterday we had two questions that we didn't have time to get to. So. I thought we might reflect on those really quickly, just to respect the fact that people listened well enough to a ask some questions. Um, one was, um, as you remember, we were talking about um, community grant making at one point, and someone who was listening online asked, how do you balance accountability with trust in funding community grant making? And I know, um, Brian, you had started talking about that, so if you, either any of you have any thoughts about that? I guess, I guess you guys would go for it. No. <laughs> I don't <laughs> always prefer to be second or third, <laughs> not first. <laughs> so, you know, um, government is accountable. There's stewards of government money, taxpayer money. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, um, like I'll give you an example of some of the things we've been talking about. You know, there is paperwork to fill out, but maybe, like, we're planning on helping people fill out that paperwork, right? Like, um, you know, doing the hand-holding mm -hmm. so people can understand how to apply, you know, doing those early sessions. And then, you know, what's the reporting? You know, does it have to be, I mean, do you need monthly reporting? Can it be like bi-monthly or annual? Like, you know, like, you know what, what is the, what's the threshold that allows government to still be accountable for the money and how you're spending it and the, 
the level of reporting and um, you know that that structure I think is is really important to think through, so that organizations that have not typically gotten funding because they haven't been able to reach the threshold of what the requirements are for government, you know, accountability. So thinking about how, how can you create a pathway and then a structure that allows more players at the table. I, th I don't know. That's Thanks, Brenna. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'll add to that um, from the you know community foundation side. I think that there's a real role for community foundations to play in getting organizations up to the point where they can apply for larger pots of money. Uh, there's been a movement across the country on collaborative philanthropy, um, grassroots philanthropy, and foundations are and giving circles. And so foundations are starting to recognize uh, that there's a lot of good work being done in communities by very small organizations who don't necessarily have uh, the capacity to meet onerous reporting requirements. And so I think there's a role to be played there as another partner. Uh, the other thing I would say, and this is something that Alicia and I talked about yesterday, is thinking about the grant making cycle, um, including the length of grants and whether or not that matches the work that's being done. So if you need time to ramp up, uh, to hire people to do program design, can we build that into the grant making process in addition to providing some capacity uh, on evaluation? So maybe even rethinking some of the processes and timelines to better match the work that's being done. Thanks, Julia. Felipe, did you? Yes. I would. I want to add up to something that Brina said about language, the importance of language. So engagement is a form of, of communication. I want to give an, a beautiful example, I think, about something that happened in Colombia just some months ago. The Constitution, and this will be very interesting for you, uh, no, Wendy, also it. as a constitutional lawyer, <laughs> uh, because the Constitutional Court transformed one of its decisions. It was a decision that had to do with, with a child. And the, the person that was going to be impacted by the, by the ruling was going to be that child. So the Constitutional Court wrote the, the decision for the child in the language of an 80-year-old child. It's a beautiful decision. Wow. It's a beautiful decision in which the court doesn't use legal language. Yeah. It talks to the boy as if it were a, an uncle or a friend or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like we, the court, we, you know that we are, you are having problems, that you are having this, we are going to do this, your mom is going to do this, and it was, it was beautiful. I think that something like that we have to think yeah. in the field of saving engagement. We have to transform languages to be able to communicate to all the different publics that we care about. What a story. That, that's yeah, awesome. I um, that. Yeah. I, mean, I can have a whole conversation in acronyms. Can you? I, yeah. I can. Like, <laughs> yeah. And so, but like, we, we do a really awful job of simplifying, like techno speak, um, you know, and so we're working really hard to try to do, do that. And when you bring plain language into the conversation, you also allow for translation. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, not just for limited English learners, but for people that might not, you know, read at a certain grade level. Like, you know, it's just, it's so important. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. But if anyone wants to have a conversation acronyms later, I'm happy. That's <laughs> <laughs> what Brian does for fun. Um, so very quickly, because we have a panel that's going to come on right after you. But another question that was asked yesterday that we didn't get to is, what are your recommendations for resources to learn skills in consensus building? So this is uh, right in my shop. So um, I think you know there's an opportunity for public universities to be good partners in providing trainings. And so uh, for universities to rethink the way that they do training and that it's not always for credit or degrees. Uh, and so one of the things that we're working on at the Ruckles House Center is providing community opportunities to learn things like facilitation, collaborative policy making. And so I think there are already existing forums where we can build this stuff out, don't recreate the wheel, um, but it's sort of the onus is on universities and other training entities to get into communities, figure out what it is they need, and then provide that. Okay. I think that's an excellent solution. Um, <laughs> but I'll just add that, you know, we've been doing some work internally to build capacity as well within government. So um, 
simple things like facilitation. Um, uh, we just did a whole session. Uh, we brought in um, just a resident who has expertise in uh, doing training on asking the right questions and designing for good engagement. Um, survey design, uh, uh, analytics, how to, how to do the qualitative analysis. You know, all those, in, those that skill building internally um, and there's experts across government, but also in our community. We have community leaders who are experts, and so, um, and they're and they're happy to provide their time and expertise and wisdom. So, um, we've been really lucky. Yeah, uh, Wendy, I will I will say uh, three short things on this on this matter. Um, the first one um, would be a lot of deliberation. We need a lot of deliberation to try to be, build consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to talk a lot. We need to talk a lot, so that's why it's not just about a web page, it's not just about sending a letter, it's about to talk to others and to see what really matters, what really afraids people, what really makes them sad, and then when you, when you talk and when you, when you have that time, you can start building um, uh, this, this kind of, of, of consensus. The second thing, the second tool, very practical tool, that I would include in forms of public engagement is visualization. So when we th see things, when, when we actually see them, we can understand them better. So for example, if we are talking about something related to land issues about a neighborhood, we have to go to the neighborhood we have to go to the neighborhood and we have to see the place and we have to see what, why a community is so worried about this space changing the, its use or something. That's very important. Visualization in deliberation, of course. And the third one is I think that we have to be creative in using novel, innovative forms of decision. So, Avoid majority rule and use, for example, other forms of decision. For example, rank choice voting. When you can prioritize different things, you can say, okay, my first option would be this one, my second one would be this one, my third one would be this one. Or for example, forms of decision that allow you to grade an issue to say, okay, it's not from zero to 10, I wouldn't say 10, but maybe I would say seven, okay, there's a space where we can make an agreement. So I think that those forms of decision are very important in deliberation. Majority rule, it's okay, but it's a last resource. It's the first resource in our representative democracy, but perhaps would be the last resource in deliberative democracy. Before that, we can do a lot of things. Because friends don't vote, right? Yeah, because friends don't vote. Yeah, <laughs> Friends talk. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, thank you all so much. Also, um, I think this question may have come from the room yesterday. So, Nusat, would you raise your hand, please? Nusat Ahmed, right there. She is very involved in the training program here at PSU, so there's lots of resources there. Um, I know Cynthia has resources, so there's lots of friends in the room that can help um, with those resources as well. So, thank you all so much. You'll get to, we'll get to say goodbye um, before we leave, so um, let's rejoin the table. And I'd like to introduce my friend Damon, who's going to, um, to bring up the next panel, Stories from Portlanders. Thank you for joining us all today. Um, and I know all of you were not able to join us um, the previous two days. One of the most amazing aspects of this process is being able to hear from both Portlanders and guest experts um, from different parts of the city. Um, you've heard from some of our guest experts, but this is one of the most powerful things that we were able to hear from folks from East Portland uh, the first day, um, folks from Northeast Portland the second day, and, and culminating today, be able to hear from some engagers and community committed individuals that are representative of downtown and, and uh, in, our, in our warm community of Portland. Um, so please think of this next 
session as a kind of a continuation of what we just heard. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit about each of our panelists, and, and if you can, please come up as I read a little bit about your bio. Cynthia Carmina Gomez is Portland State University's Director of Community and Civic Impact, where she brings ideas and knowledge into practice through community-centered initiatives. She serves on the university's Climate Justice Committee and Hispanic Serving Institution Initiatives. She oversees Latin Futures, a collaboration with the Latin community um, aimed at co-creating a bold vision for our community's future. An Oregon Governor's Gold Civic Leadership Awardee, she has 22 years of experience as a faculty in higher education administrator and worked 10 years at Latino Network coordinating leadership programs. Cynthia is a creative writer and holds an MFA in nonfiction writing. Please welcome Cynthia. <laughs> Antonio Savin Gonzalez immigrated from Mexico and grew up in Portland. Antonio served as a Multnomah Youth Commissioner and is passionate about making advocacy accessible. Please welcome Antonio. <laughs> Darlene Urban Garrett has been doing community development since before graduating with her undergrad degree in social work. Through undertaking a range of need assessments, she became passionate about assessing communities and working with community members to plan and solve identified issues. Now her work focuses more on solutions versus needs. After receiving her master's in public administration, she was able to help communities at another level by breaking through government and red tape to get issues solved. Her work has taken her to Germany in working with the communities of the United States Army in Europe, to Kansas City where she worked as a neighborhood development specialist, and to other cities including Cheyenne, Wyoming, Little Rock, Arkansas, and Hot Springs, Arkansas, and Kalush, Ukraine. She worked with indigenous people in Northern California. Most recently in Appalachia, she worked as a county community development manager and as a borough manager focused on community development. Before coming to Neighbors West Northwest, she volunteered for six years serving the unsheltered of Portland. Darlene has two children, Tierney, also a Portland resident, and Ian of St. Petersburg, Florida. Her strongest belief and favorite quote is from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Please welcome Darlene. I kind of also want to honor this space for what was previously mentioned. Uh, um, you know, it's just writing down some of what was said in the previous panel about um, being less extractive and more deliberative and more tolerant and, and engagement as a form of communication. And a, a lot of de deliberation is needed to build consensus. And lastly, about visualization. And that when we see things, we can understand them better. I really think that after this is all over with, I'm going to write a book of poetry just of what P Felipe has said <laughs> and publish it. So, um, you know, but holding that space for that, I just, if you can, each of you all have really, really been committed in your own individual communities. Um, and, and if you can, I'd like each of you to share a bit about an experience that you've had with community engagement that you feel like either went well, or it can be a combination of community engagement experiences that you'd like to share with us and that highlight with us in terms of, you know, kind of keeping along that same dialogue around what, what can we learn from the experience that you would like to share with us. Um, I don't want to like pinpoint anybody to go first because I know going out have a panel sometimes it can be like <laughs> to the line, but just whomever wants to kind of step up first and share. Good. 
I'm going to go first, even though I think I'm third on the agenda that exists. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm going to start off with my favorite quote that um, Damon ended with, because I think it is at the heart of civic engagement. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. It's a Margaret Mead quote, not Margaret Mead, 1901 to 1978. That's not our future. That's a bit of wisdom from the past. <laughs> so uh, before I begin my story of civic engagement, I feel compelled to share a couple of truths about this work. Again, I think this is a truism, present, past, future. People do not engage if they are not interested in the subject for engagement. You may have a meeting and nobody comes. You might want to, at that point, decide maybe this isn't the thing that people really want to engage around. That is, uh, that's a truism. Um, if people don't show up at your meetings, they're just not interested. If people do show up at your meetings, you know that you have landed on something that is relevant for that community. So getting that small group of engaged people is a first step always with civic engagement. That small group of thoughtful, committed citizens. And then once people are engaged, um, I use a very basic process to move forward. Um, First step always is educating on the subject matter. People may show up at the table, but, and they, and, and the example I'm gonna use is uh, with houselessness here in Portland. <clears throat> we started um, a committee out of the Downtown Neighborhood Association um, for people interested in the houseless situation in Portland. Eight people came to a meeting. Even though there were 15 on the list that said that they were interested in this, that signed up, as a member of the Downtown Neighborhood Association because they were interested in houselessness, um, eight people came to the meeting. That was the beginning. And then I'll jump forward to where we just had a meeting in um, a couple weeks, or a week or so, last week, I guess. We had over 100 and, um, or over 200 people at the meeting. So eight to 200 because the issue that we are working on is houselessness. And for neighborhood associations in Portland, it's probably that and crime are probably two of the number one issues. So civic engagement. We were dealing with something that people were truly interested in. So we started our downtown neighborhood association homeless houseless team, eight people. We had the first thing, educate yourself about the problem. We were a bunch of lay people. We really knew nothing. All we saw were people in our streets. We didn't know exactly what was causing it. We didn't know how many there were. We, did, we knew nothing. So if we were going to be a committee that was going to deal with houselessness, obviously education was the first step. So we held an educational forum on houselessness here in Portland. Almost 200 people came. Again, we hit on something. People didn't know what was going on in our streets. This was in, um, we held this in 2019. People saw, they didn't really know why were so many people sleeping in our streets? What is the cause of this? And what are the issues out there that are making this happen individually with, with people? Was it affordable housing? Was it behavioral health issues? Was it, and this is typically the reason, a series of god-awful circumstances that brought people into the street. So we educated the population, um, just under 200 people, um, about homelessness. We had people that were homeless that presented, this is why we're here, this is what happened to us. We had experts, um, this is, these are the services we provide, these are our weak links, these are our strengths. So through that, we came out the other side of that uh, forum, 360 solutions, I will say, of how to solve the houseless situation in Portland in 2019. And that was basically lay people and professionals working together in tables like this. We came up with 360 odd solutions, and some of them were odd. So um, 
So from those 360 solutions, next step, always set some priorities. What are you going to do? Now we're educated. We have three, 360 solutions that we're going to get our arms around. What are we going to do next? So that 200 or almost 200 people that came to the forum was now back down to 10 or 15. And so 10 or 15 of us gathered around. And I always tell people, if you have two, more than two people in the room, have the meeting, because that begins that small group of committed citizens that's interested in doing something. So don't ever feel discouraged when you only have five people in a room for a meeting, because that's the beginning. OK, so we set priorities. We developed a plan. Uh, we looked for resources. And we implemented a few things. The first, and this sounds so minor, but it turned out to be such an issue for us. The first thing that we advocated for were porta potties. We needed to get porta potties into the streets. Our committee, number one priority, get people a place to go to the bathroom. That was difficult, which I found to be kind of unusual that when we called the city and said we need to put porta potties in, the city was like, well, no, this is a, this is going to be a problem. And, and I'm not saying porta potties were the beat all end all because they are problematic in their own right. But at least we were giving people a place to go to the bathroom and, um, and raise dignity in that regard as well. So um, it's just a, a very basic planning process, set priorities, develop an implementation, implementation plan, develop resources, implement, evaluate. Basic, basic to everything that we do every day. And yet, when you do civic engagement, these are the basic steps that a community group will need to have to go through in order to take next steps. In my work, I never do anything um, on my own. If, and I always tell people, well, you can disagree with me, but there's a huge number of people behind me that are agreeing to the same thing. So while you might disagree with me, understand I never show up alone to anything that I'm advocating for or solutions that I want to implement. I've got a group of sit and always citizens behind me. Um, so with the downtown homeless houseless team, that moved forward. And um, we, did, we did the educational forum. Uh, we advocated for some policy changes. The other thing we started advocating for were alternative shelters. Because at that point, the county was um, not hearing us when we said, yes, a home for everyone is absolutely the gold standard. That's where we need to go. However, the tents keep coming, and the tents keep coming, and the tents keep coming. So we started pushing for alternative shelters. And I'm pretty sure we were some of the first people that showed up at the joint office saying, we need alternative shelters. You just can't build your way out of this. We need to have alternative situations. And so from that, we saw the Safe Rest Villages popping up. We saw churches engaging in building um, um, alternative shelters. And that whole movement started taking off. And now we have the mayor who's proposing um, uh, some campuses with up to 150 people each. Um, I'm not saying that that's the beat all, end all. But it is a step in the alternative shelter movement that we just simply had to have. Um, we feel we reached a point of a humanitarian crisis here in Portland with our houseless situation. And to see so many people that um, um, were not only unhoused, but lacking hygiene facilities, lacking, um, we did a, a the downtown homeless houses team did a survey. They talked to 60 of their unhoused residents in downtown and were able to see that they did, had no ID cards. So now there's a whole program coming together, an offshoot of this, churches coming together, saying that they can do the ID card. They can really work with res, um, our houseless residents to do ID cards. So um, we are making an impact, this homeless houseless team, of a scraggly eight people, which did include people with lived experience in homelessness, as well as experts. And that's one of the beauties of Portland that I have not experienced necessarily in my career in civic engagement, is the level of education in Portland. The people that show up at your table are just like the best that you could possibly ask for. You know, we, we started uh, proposing a Safe Rest Village or a QA Village in downtown. And I, there was a woman there that um, did 
um, um, shelters for refugees all over, all over the world. And so here she was sitting to try to put together a village for less than 30 people, and she had the experience, worldwide experience, of setting up villages um, in Syria, in Afghanistan. So just bringing the citizens to the table will usually yield not just fantastic expertise, but resources as well. Good, um, the Homeless Houses team started what we called a Good Neighbor Project, where we were delivering in wagons 35 volunteers, um, citizens, 35 volunteers delivering in wagons survival goods to our unhoused residents. So uh, citizen engagement has been my career from day one. Uh, the very first thing I ever did was um, a needs assessment of um, community services for the military in Germany. Again, citizens, citizens saying this, is, this works, this doesn't work. Military and families just alike. And so I don't know any other way to operate except through civic engagement. Thank you, Darlene. I don't know how many minutes that was. Oh, I just want to add one last thing, and this is an old person too, um, old person sticking up for the elderly here. Um, there's a woman, and you may have heard of her, but I do want to throw this to everybody. And it is a way to measure where you're at in the civic engagement process. And it's some, and if you haven't heard of her, you should take a look. Sherry Arnstein, and she has created the ladder of citizen participation. And I still use it. It really tells me where people are at with the level of engagement that's going on. And specifically, um, and then I'll say one last thing. Bureaucrats need to understand civic engagement. Um, I have an MPA. I was not taught once about civic engagement in my entire, now I got that in the late 90s. So I was not taught about civic engagement as in becoming a public administrator. And so I really believe that this is not something necessarily just for citizens. It is for bureaucrats as well to understand civic engagement. Like I say, every citizen that calls the city is doing civic engagement. How the city responds or doesn't respond lets me know how they do civic engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Antonio Serene Gonzalez. I am a youth development professional, and I'm also a student at Portland State University. Uh, my major is in Spanish, specifically like thinking about heritage speakers and how we don't really get the opportunity to learn our language the way that we should. Um, and through that, I've learned that like education isn't always just formal. There's education that we receive from many different folks in our lives. Um, so just a little bit about like, I grew up in uh, outer Southeast Portland. Um, I always confused between like, am I in Gresham, am I in Portland? I'm not sure. Um, and when I lived there as a young person, I was involved in many different like programs and projects um, from like student leadership to volunteering at my local library to being a part of the Maloma Youth Commission. Um, all things that like helped me develop leadership skills. And out of those things, I took two phrases with me. One is that you are the expert of your own experience. So I work with middle schoolers, so no one knows what it's like to be an 11-year-old at the school I work at than the 11-year-old at the school I work at. And the second thing is, there should never be a decision about us without us. We should always be at the table um, and even making the decisions ourselves. Um, as a youth development professional, one of like my biggest goals is to support young people in getting the language to advocate for their needs. You know, oftentimes adults view young people as, oh, you know, they're growing up, they're like being silly or like they're goofing off or whatever. But th when you sit down and talk to young people, they actually, they know what's going on. They feel it, you know. Um, a lot of people like to use the phrase, youth are our future, but I countered that with there are now, like the decisions we make now are impacting them directly. Um, one example is a program called Youth Pass, something that the Maluma Youth Commission and the 
youth environmental justice something from Opal um, do, I like advocated for so that like every young person in Portland Public Schools could have a bus pass and then expand that to like young people in Multnomah County so, or the city of Portland so that they have access to transit so they can access things like a library, recreational opportunities, other things that you know our city and county provide. Um, I was really like inspired by the topic of language earlier. Um, that's one of the things that I am like working heavily towards um, in many aspects, because the the reality is that our language excludes a lot of people. Um, by switching to using plain language, we are inviting folks to think more critically, to ask questions, to like feel more comfortable engaging in different spaces. Um, I'm like a huge advocate for youth development programming. I think that uh, the way that we currently fund youth development programs uh, doesn't really meet the needs of our young people because there's so much restrictions. And um, on the counterpiece, the person who's doing the mentoring, you know, they're like keeping up with all these grant requirements instead of showing up for young people, which is what we should be doing. And within philanthropy and like fundraising, the reality is that you know folks want to fund the program, right? They want to fund the impact, but they don't want to fund the person who's leading that impact. You know, mentors, youth development professionals, they deserve a living wage. You know, they they shouldn't have to use the resources that their nonprofit is offering because they can't make ends meet. You know, yes, it's cool to fund like summer trips to Smith Rock, you know, and making sure that young people have opportunities to recreation. It's also cool to fund the ability for someone to pay their rent, you know, and not have to work one or two or more jobs. Um, yeah, uh, recently, like, I started working with Cynthia uh, around, like, gathering youth and, like, figuring out, like, what is the future of Portland? And I'm really excited for that work to kick off because I do think that like young people have the solutions. Um, I remember there was a conversation that I was having with a group of uh, young folks there. We were like figuring out like a budget problem. You know, our program was like, you know, kind of a niffy spot, and I was like, I brought it up to them because, you know, it impacts them directly. And I remember that I was I was hearing an idea, and I was like, well, we can't do that because, and then I like stopped because they asked me like, why not? And then I had to think about it. You know, is it that we can't really do that or that we haven't done it before? And so that's scary, you know? It's scary to do something that's different. Um, but we need, we need creativity, we need innovation, we need to create space for folks to be innovative. Um, and I think that one of those like crucial partners is our universities. Um, you know, at Portland State University, we have a motto of let knowledge, let knowledge serve the city, which I think is beautiful and super powerful. Um, and so my question is always like, in what ways is knowledge serving the city? You know, we have some type of programming, um, some like a lot of partnerships, which is awesome. And then we also hear the issue of like declining enrollment, which impacts funding. So how do we, as a as a university, continue to serve the city, let knowledge serve the city, if we're not in the city? You know, we're we're there here and there, but not. No one knows, like, oh, you know what? I have a great experience at Portland State University. And that's what I really want to hear. Um, just because I'm someone who was like, I'm not going to Portland State University. Um, and I'm so glad I ended up here because it is a fantastic institution. And I feel so honored for the experiences that I've gotten here. Yeah. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just a plug that students will be rallying in Salem uh, for the Public University Fund on Thursday at 4 o'clock. Uh, so everybody who cares about higher education, um, you know, we need, we need support. Portland State needs support. We are Portland's university. Um, and our motto is let knowledge serve the city. So help us do that. We're a minority serving institution. Um, we serve Pell, you know, more Pell eligible students. Um, that means uh, low income students. Um, uh, you know, we, we serve many first generation students. And so, you know, we're, we're worth the investment. So help us out. <laughs> Call your uh, lawmakers and help us. Anyway, um, uh, 
I just want to say too, thank you, Antonio, for um, just stepping up and um, being willing to work with me on a project called the Youth Future Summit that we're hoping to hold next year or in the, in the next year and a half, depending on if we can get the funds. Um, we received $64,000 from the Oregon Community Foundation to hire three Futures Fellows, Antonio is one of them, to be able to build on the work that Portland State has been doing around dreaming up our future, what does it look like using our imagination, and, and not just responding to the here and now, but really looking forward in the future and claiming that future for ourselves and making that future a reality. So really excited about that. But today I'm here to talk about a project that I worked on uh, many years ago um, called Diverse Civic Leaders. is a project that's funded out of the city of Portland. Um, we have neighborhood associations in Portland, but we also, the city of Portland also recognized that many of those neighborhood associations did not represent the people of their communities. That many people were silenced because they didn't know the issues. Um, they didn't know how to engage city government. So Diverse Civic Leaders is a project project that funds community-based organizations to, be, to do community-specific um, uh, leadership development um, in often monolingual, uh, monolingual uh, non-English speaking communities. The community that I worked with was a fund that was allocated to Latino Network. And um, we, when we first received this fund, um, uh, staff at Latino Network reached out to me and they were like, Cynthia, you do leadership development because I'd been doing leadership development with high schoolers and, and college students uh, for many years. And so they asked me to, do, to lift up this program. So I was working with staff at Latino Network, um, mostly monolingual Sp Spanish-speaking staff, professionals uh, in their field who um, were, uh, their methodology was popular education. So if the, for those of you who don't know what it is, I can, I can go on about it, but essentially all the knowledge that you need to solve a problem is already in the room. And it's tapping into that knowledge that's already in the room to solve those complex issues. Now, the approach that I took when I built Lideres um, was, yes, popular education, but also folks in the community don't know how to engage our government because, because they, because they're, you know, they're, there's language issues, there's income issues, there's um, issues of fear of, uh, of deportation and things of that nature. And, um, and so what we would do is we would go to the, um, the trailer parks, we would go to apartment complexes, and we would essentially just knock on doors. And we'd be like, hey, ¿qué pasó, señora? ¿Cómo está usted? You know, we just start talking to them. And they were like, many of them were like, yes, I want to do this. And it was really interesting. We had, it was mostly women who participated because um, those, were the, those were the people who were interested in or who had um, maybe a little bit of time while their children were at school to engage us. We always made all of our activities accessible. Um, we did everything in Spanish. Um, and what we would do is, oh, and the other thing we did is we started Lidercitos, which was like for the little ones to come with um, the parents and they would engage in leadership development and read books and um, and dream up things and it was really really exciting and then they would get to come in and talk to elected officials talk to policymakers because what we would do it was we go around we'd go to the city of Portland we'd go to council chambers we'd um, teach uh, our um, our participants how to um, provide public testimony how to talk to elected how we taught them how the system was set up with the goal for them to be able to go in and influence and impact the system and change the system for them so that the system would be responsive to them. We went to Metro, we met with Metro uh, counselors, we sat in their council chambers. Um, our, uh, our participants basically talked to the counselors and said this is what we need, this is what we're thinking about, this is what would help us and this is what would encourage us to be more participatory in your processes. We went to Multnomah County and sat in their council chambers. We learned about um, Prosper Portland. I don't even 
even remember what they were called before. They were called something else. But anyway, we went to Prosper Portland. Uh, we learned a little bit about the port and the quasi-governmental organizations. Um, and we also, um, we also taught all of these folks um, popular education methodology and, um, and taught them uh, the value of and the impact that that could have in policy making and law making. Um, communities are already, uh, already have the skills. And um, for us, it was really important to use curriculum that anybody could use. So everything that we did, all the curriculum that could be used could be used could, we could do with a young child, we could do with an elder, we could do with anybody coming from any part of the world. Um, and that was really important to us and very impactful in the way we were able to deliver and, and show our income or outcomes. I do want to say, though, that I was uh, um, struggling financially when I was facilitating. So when, when you were saying that about how we need to also compensate our community engagement specialists, I feel that. I remember um, driving around in my little, my little old car and um, putting like, you know, bins and bins and bins of things in the, in the trunk of my car and driving all around and like photocopying things on my little photocopier that was like, you know, not, <laughs> Whatever, you know, staying up all night trying to get it done because I was so passionate about the work, but it shouldn't be like that. You know, folks that really know how to engage community and are in there and doing the good work, they should be compensated, they should be honored, they should be given those resources to be able to thrive. And, you know, I would say diverse civic leaders, those non geographic neighborhoods that are in Portland that are doing that good work, they need that support. So I encourage the city to continue funding that program. Um, we are very siloed. Uh, we're very siloed in all of the things that we do through the bureaus, um, through, you know, even like the neighborhoods and the way we're organized and the way that income is distributed or not distributed in the city. And so that is really a challenge. And that was something that we try to get at in the work that we did was really getting in front of just everyday people so that they could hear our story. And so we did a lot of work in the community too, tabling at events, letting people know this is what we're doing and how we did how we do it and why it is important um you know, I come from, uh, um, I was born in Camp 52, it's a migrant camp outside of Phoenix, uh, Arizona. I was born, I was raised in the border. I spent most of my, I spent many, many years of my, um, of my childhood in Mexico, traveling across the border and back. Um, and one thing that I noticed that's a difference between the United States and the place where I was exposed in Mexico, which is Sinaloa, um, is this regional pride and political pride. You know, in Mexico, in my little town in Batamote, where um, I spent a lot of my formative young years, um, there would be elections, and it was like the whole city shut down, everybody was really into it, the candidates would like, and their supporters would load up in the back of a truck and honk their horn and drive all through town, and everyone was just like cheering, and then whoever won, won, and then there was this big party, and there were like no arguments, <laughs> and it was just this really beautiful process of this thing that's just just really uh, a prideful, um, a fun thing. It was fun, right? And so I feel like we need to bring the fun back into it. Like, right? Like, where is the joy in this? Where is the, the music, the art, the culture? We need to infuse more art and culture. I'm so inspired by Alex Chu, if any of you know him. He's a muralist in town. It's just amazing work. And, and really embodies what civic engagement is through art, through these beautiful murals. I saw the most recent mural he painted. It's in the port, in the, um, at the port, in the, in the airport. It is stunning. It is so amazing. And so it's just like I think about that and think about the joy and the fun and events like these that really bring people together, share food, and have good conversation with lots of different folks. Um, so I'm just really... I'm, I feel joyful today. I'm really glad to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Cynthia. I really appreciate how um, you all have spoken to really something that sometimes governments think of in terms of deliverables, but through human-centered processes. And I really appreciate how you all have spoken to that in different ways. And Antonio, I mean, um, 
saying that you are the expert of your own experience. Um, there should never be a decision made without us. Um, and you talked about the, the personal economy of you know, community engagement and, that, and the, the costs um, and investing <laughs> in, in that and the need for to do that. Um, Cynthia uh, talked about claiming our future for ourselves and thank you for sharing with us that your experience with uh, the diverse, um, diverse civic leaders um, process and about bringing forth to the popular education as a model and thank you for speaking to joy to fun to music to art and to culture and and thank you so much um, Darlene and, and also really emphasizing your experience around the importance of engaging stakeholders in educating yourself on a problem in a particular process and no matter if you I really appreciate what you were sharing about if you have two people that's enough for a meeting <laughs> um, please think about what you've heard with everyone here what they just shared and please think about what you heard previous to that in terms of what our guest experts shared as Wendy and Cynthia, um, Cynthia leads you forward on futures thinking and an actually an engagement project that we're all going to work on in terms of really really thinking about what's the kind of Portland that you want to see or what's the kind of community you want to see regardless of where you may live even the folks online so please thank you thank you everyone so much friends actually yes we are <laughs> um, um, thank you that was great I actually forgot that I was supposed to come up here because I was so involved in listening to you all I'm like oh yeah I got to do something now. so um, so Cynthia plays many roles at this university and we're so grateful for her friendship and um, leadership and wisdom um, one of those roles of course is a, a leader in community engagement but also as she teased is um, is, a, is a, an expert in futures thinking, and we're gonna do a couple of exercises about futures thinking this afternoon. So if the OKT team, if you don't mind distributing supplies while Cynthia sort of leads the first exercise, so then we can go right into the second ex uh, exercise. So, Cynthia? Um, so this work, uh, this model, or this little activity I'm about to share is from the Institute from the Future. Um, they have uh, great resources. They have a free Coursera um, uh, course that you can take um, on futures thinking. It's led by Jane McGonigal. Uh, she wrote a book called Imaginable because she did this work. Uh, she did a, an environmental scan of um, news articles and um, pieces and found that uh, the word unimaginable came up so many times, so she was compelled to write a book called Imaginable, which is really great. It's a, it's a fascinating book, by the way, and she's got a great website. I, I encourage you to check her out, Jane McGonigal. Anyway, our future selves are strangers to us. This isn't just a poetic metaphor, it's a neurological fact. Actively imagining your future selves can make the future feel more urgent, prime our brains to pay closer attention to it, and motivate us to actively shape the future today. So um, we want, what we want to do is we want to reverse this glitchy behavior in our brains that makes it hard for most people to put significant time in thinking into the future because we're just so overwhelmed, right? We're just trying to get through our day. We're just trying to get that report in. We're just trying to balance that budget. We're just trying to get our children fed. We're just trying to get those vegetables that I just bought into the ground before they wilt on my back porch, right? <laughs> and that's happened to me before because I get so busy, right? So we want to increase our cognitive flexibility and prime the brain to be more open to the ways that the future will be different than today because it will be. And if we don't build the future that we want for ourselves, I guarantee you somebody else will. So we need to be actively working on that. So um, what we're gonna do is we're going to, I want you to just think on your own, um, just in your own, close your eyes, do whatever you need to do, journal, draw. Think about how much has changed in your life in the last 10 years. Think 10 years ago, 
technology, uh, the way you came together, what you were driving, where you were walking. Now that you have that, um, be thinking about that as I place you 10 years into the future. Now, um, you know, I've, I've, done, I've done this work with all different age groups, you know, um, uh, little ones and elders, you know, and if you're, I'll just, I'll just encourage you a little, if you're an elder and you're thinking, well, ten, 10 years from now, like if I were to ask my mom, she'd probably be like, well, mija, maybe I won't be here in 10 years. Well, that's okay. Think about the people that are close to you, your loved ones. Think about what you, if you were still around, what would the world be like? I want you to think about yourself in 2032. It is 2032. How old are you? How old are the people around you? Can you imagine a way that you might physically be different at this time? The people around you, how are they physically different? How has the environment impacted them? If we're shifting 20 degrees from one day to the next, like we have in the last couple of days in Portland, what do you think that will look like in 10 years? And how will our bodies be experiencing that? Can you imagine one way your family might be different, your family life? Who might you live with? How have your daily habits changed? In what ways are you resilient to climate change? Can you imagine how any current technologies might serve you in the future or be, maybe be developed in the future to serve us better, to be more resilient to climate change? Can you imagine one way you might be better or a stronger version of yourself? Is there a new skill you've learned or improved or a habit that you've changed? Maybe you've decided to stop eating meat or to shop locally. I, I'm planting some seeds here, I'll admit. Perhaps you've survived or lived through something that will have made you wiser or more resilient. Perhaps we've lived through a natural catastrophe. We often talk about the earthquake. What would that look like? How would that make Portland different or our lives different? We are strangers to ourselves. FMRI studies suggest that when you imagine your future self, your brain stops acting as if you're thinking about yourself. Instead, it starts acting as if you're thinking about a completely different person. Interestingly, the further out in time you try to imagine your own life, the less, the less brain activity you show. Your brain acts as if your future self is someone you don't know very well and don't care about. Our future selves feel like strangers. We leave the future for them to worry about and stay focused on maximizing our happiness and success in the present only. And that is really important when we think about civic engagement because if that's what we're thinking when we're thinking about ourselves, imagine how much more distant we are in imagining our neighbors and the people around us that we work with and live with and make art with and sing with and worship with. If we can't even do that for ourselves, our brain has such a hard time doing that, how are we doing that for others? So we have to work really hard. We have to be very present and very active in thinking about our future. So as you keep this future version of yourself in your mind, as you discuss the future, remember it's not just the world that will be different in the future, but we ourselves 
will be different when we get there. So we're not just thinking about the systems and the things that might be different, but how we are organisms in that system, in that ecosystem, in that constellation, in our global society, how we are all different. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, I kind of I feel like I'm in a dream state, like hypnotized in a way. And so, um, so I like let's try to keep the dream state going as we go into this next exercise. Um, and you know, Cynthia led us right to it, right? Which is ten years from now. Um, try to um, you each have a worksheet. So take that space that you were in. And I'm going to give you about five minutes just to make some notes. Um, and you'll see if you're online, there's a Google um, Doc that I think Sarah's put in the chat probably that you can use to um, follow along at home. And, um, and just describe in much, as much detail. Um, try to inhabit that person you'll be. Try to care about that person you'll be. And as, um, as Felipe said earlier, the the generations and animals and places that are available with you then too. Um, and to write in much detail as possible about um, an, an engagement idea that has captivated you, either here or elsewhere, um, what, it what it would look like um, in Portland if it came to life. So first write about that. And then as you sort of tap that out, then what other ways would Portland Will Portland be different if that, um, that idea comes to life? So not just engagement, but in other parts of um, Portlanders' life. So we're sort of taking the individual imagination that Cynthia led us through into a collective, um, into imagining our collective. And then, of course, what else might happen? Are there unintended consequences that might happen from your idea? Are there trade-offs that need to be made? So just make some notes. Um, for about five minutes, and then we'll get a chance to, um, to talk with our um, neighbors here in a moment. So I'm going to be quiet so you can stay inside your own imagination. Okay, I'm going to call you back from that. Um, and now we're going to um, collectivize even further by um, joining together at tables. And um, especially some of our guests, if you'd like to join, spread out and join tables, it would be great. Um, gather up and start to talk about your visions together um, and um, what that's going to look like. And then we're going to ask you to, I, Cynthia, I, we must have been like in some kind of mind lock this morning, to make a mural. On your on your um, on your big piece of paper with your markers, and there's more colors. If you don't like the colors you have, I've can, I can fix you up. Um, so, to what you're going to do is speak together about this future that you imagined, um, and start to to find places where there's intersections, where you think um, that where there's where there's a shared version of it, and you can do anything you want. You can make a map, you can make a drawing, you can you can make um, charts, whatever the whatever visual representation, a wordle um, works for you um, on your on your shared piece of paper. Um, you'll have about a half hour to work together um, and and to talk, share, and um, create a, a, a vision um, together. And it can be worded or wordless, depending on what um, what works for you. So. We'll um, be, I'll be walking around and getting you things that you need and um, enjoy each other's company and, and uh, living in, in the year 2033. And folks, um, for those of you who are online, um, you can make your mural um, in any language that you're um, speaking and working in right now and then take a photograph of it and email it. I think it's in the chat where you need to email it, and we'll make we'll start to project it up on the screen. So, in the um, in the interpretation rooms, don't worry about it. Uh, use whatever language you're working in. 
um, to um, get it back to us. So looking forward to uh, seeing where you are. I want to remind you, too, that um, you can define community in whatever way you would like. So community can be whatever you'd like it to be. So, um, you have about eight minutes left. But it was so fun to watch um, watch everyone work and all with all their colors and um, and exuberance. So what we're going to do? So just to orient you for the, what's going to happen for about the next not quite two hour, an hour and a half, hour and twenty minutes is we're going to have each table, someone from each table or the whole table or whoever, come and just describe what their mural is. And then you're going to take it back, and Newsot and Rosalind are going to help you hang it on that wall. So you'll come up, describe it, you know, what your thinking was. You're going to hang it on the wall. And then we're going to pass out little notes. And um, then, then we'll have about a half an hour, hopefully, depending on how long it takes to describe them, for folks to eat, get the delicious food from Mississippi chefs. And then we'll give you some note cards, well, um, I mean some um, sticky notes. And while you're doing that, you can put questions, encouragements, um, uh, please don't, not, not critiques, please, this is not a critiquing space, um, but uh, appreciations um, on other folks' mural while you eat and visit, and then we'll come back and do some closing. So we're going to ask each table to come forward, and then, you know, the, the good thing is, is you get to go, you get to eat in the order that you volunteer, so there's a, there's a, 
<laughs> there's an incentive. Um, so who would like to um, present their mural first? And if you also will notice, folks, that there is a, um, if you look at the slide, that's, um, that is a mural that was sent to us online. So we, got, we do have one online participant, so please appreciate that as well. And um, whichever table would like to go first, come join us. All right, you guys go first. <laughs> Uh, so here we envision what uh, we would like boards to look like. So often, you know, your traditional board, whether it's a school board, whether it's a uh, county commission, uh, city of city commission or city council, whatever form of board, you usually have your typical like dais and all of the elected officials, representatives, board members, commissioners sit behind the dais. And then you have, you know, some sort of executive council sitting below them, um, and then the audience, uh, full of like community members who have capacity and who are able to access that space. So in this uh, instance, accessing the board, which makes decisions, and then you have like empty seats, which are folks who are not at the table because there are many barriers. Whether that's work, whether that's like lack of childcare, uh, not having language access. Um, and then we also have, like, in the very corner, a youth representative. You know, these folks are sometimes selected by their peers, sometimes appointed by their peers, sometimes appointed by staff um, who are supposed to provide representation of the students, um, but often do not have a voting right. So they are there really just to show face. Like, here, here I am. Um, Uh, so like how Antonio said, uh, in the corner, it, this is supposed to be me as the youth rep and who doesn't have a voice but is a person sitting on the board but isn't allowed to vote. And the change that we see is making that youth person or adding more to the board so they may have more youth, a vote, and an actual voice so they can express their feelings and explain what us youth want. Um, and that's just me saying yay for being on the board. Thank you. Let's hear it for team one. So if you take your mural back to Rosalind and Nusat, and they'll help you um, hang it. So you all get to eat first. Um, who, uh, who's next? You listen to your neighbors first, though. Listen to your neighbors before you eat. <laughs> Um, but you get to go first. Okay, Shelby. <laughs> that was awesome. Shelby and Perla, I've been watching this come together. <laughs> Do you want me to hold it so you can talk? I feel like um, ours is more of sort of building all the elements that we want to see in 2033, I think this was. Um, so one of the things we talked about is having, uh, and some of these things were really discussed during this uh, session, during these sessions. So that's where some of these ideas come from. But really having a clear feedback loop, um, where you know where there's input, there's action, and people really understand um, how that um, action is being implemented. Um, and then pay for engagement and expertise. That's something that's come up over and over and over. So if we really want to engage people and ask for their expertise, we really have to show that, um, that we value that. Um, make the process fun, and that's also sparking joy um, and hope with democracy. Um, learning from each other, um, building more relationships, gathering stories, um, experiences to input the work. We talked about having a dedicated youth position on city council that's fully empowered um, with voting rights. Um, and one of the things we talked about is just kind of um, 
with city government changing and um, the form formation, or city uh, government changing and the formation of four um, districts. And the commi new commissioners are really going to be um, solely responsible for policy making. And this uh, city manager is going to be responsible for administration. So the question came up at our table is like, um, that seems like a really awesome opportunity to build bridges, but it also could create more silos. So what I mean by that is um, if, if commissioners are engaging within their districts and all the constituents are coming to them to engage, and then the city administrator and all the, the bureaus are doing their own engagement, where's the overlap? And so really considering like how um, being intentional as we're moving forward to really build that into the process because I feel like it's, it's a real opportunity but also could just create more silos. So. Awesome. Yep. Thank you, Grace, Shelby, and Perla. Okay, who's up next? Okay, you all are. Okay, uh, we, what we came up with was the idea of fashioning a council after the Native American Youth and Elders Council, where you bring youth and you bring elders get together. Uh, the, the, the idea kind of stressed from that, that uh, senior citizens are getting pushed out of some of the processes and we're seeing a lot of things for youth, and I'm going to let her describe our, our mural here while I hold it up. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So we focused um, in our table on bringing youth and elders together and having that be a form of uh, having an exchange of the both different types of problems, but coming together on, on building relationships. Uh, shared solutions, but having more uh, investment in community leaders that are leading this work so that there is a sustainable avenue for having this be implemented within the city. And so we were talking about the NIA uh, Youth and Elders being a model for this kind of uh, committee that could be a model for all types of other demographics, identities. Um, and so having fun activities in the communities, but having lots and lots of generational interconnectedness is what we thought of. And this would lead then, you know, 10 years down the line by having more investment in our collective future and realigning our city budget to reflect the people's priorities, the majority priorities, all these voices that are left out, bringing them in. And so they're being, um, feeling from youth and aging communities feeling neglected. Hopefully this would address some of those issues. One, one other quick note that Paul said at our table, we, are, we all are young at one time and most of us get old, so. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Kelsey and Terry. The, the, that was a social movement born here. Do you, so write, write down the date. Um, okay, back there. That great big sunshine looks appealing. Hi, we talked, um, we talked an awful lot about building community, community and class solidarity. And we also talked a lot about um, including youth and elders and how there's no role for the elders. Um, elders could provide things like, well, experience, but also things like childcare that is so important for people to get engaged. Um, and we also talked a lot about um, using community gardens 
as a place for people to come together and actually start talking to each other. So, I mean, it would be so wonderful if, say, there was a community garden on every block, like a space where the whole block could come together. And that would be a way to build community and class solidarity, too. I mean, if people don't know each other, they're not going to build solidarity. And one of the things that we discussed that kind of needs to happen is for people in community to understand that the whole community needs to be taken care of. You know, that would include disabled folks, houseless folks, poor folks, you know. Even if somebody couldn't participate in the community garden, that doesn't mean they wouldn't get a share of the community garden and wouldn't be a part of the neighborhood. I mean, they could help provide, you know, experience or childcare or cooking or whatever, you know. But we, we really do need to come together, and there is a huge disconnect between both the city and the people, and also, we discussed, the administration at PSU and the students. Um, I graduated from here, and I took community development, and I noticed that the, uh, the values discussed in community development were almost exactly what we discussed here. And that was so wonderful. That's the undergraduate program. But to get a job in community development in this city, you pretty much have to go through the master's program. And as a student working in the various offices, I saw that the MERT program, which is the master's in community development, the values are totally different. And that's actually most of the reason I did not take that. And so I have used a lot of the things I have learned in community development, including the grant writing and the social change and all of that in my community. But I'm not willing to compromise my values to use it in the city. Because I see that city processes, um, like for instance, I've been an activist for decades, and I've participated in I don't know how many things like this, and they're wonderful, and you meet wonderful people, and you talk about wonderful ideas, but I haven't seen a lot of change in the city. And that's what you judge it by. And we also talked about um, climate resiliency. So things like community gardens and planting more trees and things like that would really help with the heat. Like, for instance, there are a lot less trees on the east side, and it's a bit uh, hotter in the summer. And we also talked about places for youth to just be without having to like go to a mall or a coffee shop and spending money. And you know, what could it look like if we use something like depave to like actually break up some of the cement that's making things so hot and plant trees? Or more parks that actually have more native trees that are allowed to just grow instead of being landscaped and have more activities in them? And all these things would help us build community. That's, that, is a, that is a holistic and beautiful vision. Thank you both. Um, and your whole table. Nice job. Who's next? You, you all? <laughs> Hi, everyone. We had an artist on our team. Yes. <clears throat> Lovely. Um, so the kind of organizing principle that got us started was this idea of being intentional about engaging diverse voices and how that would happen. And that again includes um, all the types of groups that have been mentioned so far that um, the youth, the elderly, um, the neighborhoods, other community groups, um, affinity groups, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Training for building a level playing field um, as part of the ultimate goal of that. Um, providing ways to learn together um, so that we figure out where each other's deficits are in terms of the, the kinds of things that we want to learn more about and get better at and are able to help each other do that as opposed to expecting people um, to know how to do something that they have not yet experienced or have not had much experience with. Um, so trying to get better at doing that in our community. 
And again, the strategy always being, you know, learn, connect, and we really like this little graphic because it's, again, that notion of being able to collaborate as wherever we can and to talk as much as we can as opposed to just type things into surveys or whatever, um, and then to engage um, uh, in various ways, in, in various constellations of groups depending on issues. Um, we, the idea of building a, a leadership pipeline, and it's kind of, you know, pardon the expression, cradle to grave, but start, you know, really kids from the very beginning, their preschool, their grade school, their high school on through, are always learning to do problem solving in groups and to learn to obviously respect um, different backgrounds, different cultures, different resources. <clears throat> and, you know, using and being able to count on various institutions, the neighborhoods, the civic institutions, cultural organizations, government schools, all having the same set of values in our community by 2032 or whatever, <clears throat> and therefore fostering that kind of ongoing growth. Um, we, and, and that provides, and, and all along the way there's, um, I hate to use the on-ramp notion with freeways because I don't like them much, but that notion that there are all kinds of pathways to engage and they're, you know, they're obvious, they're, they're talked about, they're known, etc. cetera. Um, let's see. <laughs> One of the images that also sparked our conversation at the beginning was this idea of making our government structures um, so much more welcoming to people and so much easier to decode and to understand. And um, I was sort of suggesting the idea, well, we, you know, someone's there to welcome you when you walk in the door of any civic building. Um, school building for that matter, whatever it might be. And then we learned, of course, that those people in Arlington are <laughs> already have welcome booths and they have welcome ambassadors that are there to help field questions and help people find what they need in terms of engaging with their government at you know, whatever level they're there for that day. Um, and then, you know, again, overarching is this notion of, since we're looking ahead, that we're cultivating youth as future leaders. And that's, again, what this pipeline does. But the pipeline also keeps, you know, making sure that there are, to, there are options for people of all ages to be engaged and to be making a contribution so that you can feel that you're a valued member of your community. And that includes <clears throat> we older people. So is, what did I forget? Uh, the only thing I wanted to add is... Um, Mike, so people online can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, the only thing I'll add is that also what, that rep what this represents down here at the bottom part is something that we learned from Arlington that they have is a neighborhood college. And that neighborhood college is made up of people from each of these institutions. It's not just neighborhoods going to neighborhood college. It's government going to neighborhood college, it's schools going to neighborhood college. And when I say neighborhood, I think in the broader sense we're talking about preparing civic leaders for our future. And those civic leaders could find their way into government, to schools, but each one of those should be going through some sort of training around civic engagement. And that's kind of also what that represents at the bottom there. Yeah, and we talked about who would fund this, and we thought, of course, that all the obvious governmental agencies, you know, city, county, metro, should be chipping in, and um, our assorted universities um, could all be contributing to this effort, whether it's in, you know, uh, people power or um, actual funding. So that, and the one thing that we struggled with a little bit is uh, the idea of, on the one hand, it's, I'm, I'm a big fan of the diversity and civic leadership approach, where people are really um, getting comfortable with government um, with other people that you know are also learning from the same background at the same time. But then also, I have this urge that I want to bring people together who don't know each other and who don't, who think all businessmen are capitalists or all neighborhoods are, you know, uh, uh, what, uh, privileged and um, not interested in anyone but themselves or that, you know, uh, community groups are not interested in engaging with other, you know, other neighborhoods. So it's that sense of how do we bring people together from different walks of life to learn together and then respect each other more because you're, you know, walking in a sense in their shoes for a change. So anyway, that one was kind of trying to figure out how to put those pieces together. Great work. Thanks. Thanks. So I think that's everybody, right? Is there, are there any other murals hiding someplace? Okay, so um, we're, we're gonna use the honor system here on order of eating. 
So go in the order of your um, of your murals up there, and um, and uh, I guess you can eat at the same time, but just in the line. And then in the meantime, um, OKT staff, if you wouldn't mind getting um, sticky notes on the tables so people can offer encouragements, appreciations, and questions on the murals after they've had a chance to eat and visit a little bit. So enjoy each other's company. Um, as we have discussed, fellowship is, 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 is almost as important as anything else we're doing here. So thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Um, we used to, had a family policy that um, that you had to leave the birthday party before someone started crying, and um, that's kind of what we feel like. We want to finish up on a good note before like people are over sugared, over caffeinated, or crying. So um, we appreciate the fact that you're you've hung in here with us, and that we're um, we're kind of coming to the end here, where we're just going to reflect a little bit. Um, our guests. Um, uh, um, Andrew Wilkes had to be back in New York um, this morning to do a presentation, but he sends all of his good wishes. He's a delight. He'll be back to Portland. Um, and so um, our, our three guests have a chance to offer final reflections, and then we'll ask if anybody in this room and online have some final reflections before we um, do appreciations and goodbyes. So Julia, since you're sitting here, you won't tell me your middle name, but you're sitting next to me. <laughs> It turns out Bryna and I have the same middle name. Oh, so small world, yeah. I'm still not telling you though. Because <laughs> you know I'll use it. Yes. <laughs> um, so the first thing I want to express is my gratitude um, to everyone here for being here. Um, whether you're here just for today um, or all three days or online. And also my gratitude to Wendy and her team for bringing me out here and being so just wonderful. Yeah, let's give them all a round of applause. Uh, this has been phenomenal. And so I think, you know, for final reflections, uh, I would say the future is bright, right? You know, you've got engaged uh, people here. Uh, you've got engaged people, it seems, all over the city. And so I'll go back um, without being long-winded, uh, but to the five things I talked about on the first day, and that really is rooted in intentionality. So as you are moving forward uh, in Portland and thinking about what public engagement looks like, I would encourage you uh, or call you to be really intentional in the way that you design and implement public engagement. So, you know, being intentional about your mindset, so asset-based community development. Every person in every community has assets. Go into communities with the mindset that people have assets and uh, that you can build on. Don't have a deficit mindset. Also remember that communities are interdependent. Uh, so you are not there to save anyone. No one's coming to save a community, but you can grow it uh, to be, you know, even better than it than it is now, right? So um, don't be a savior, and remember that everybody has assets. Be intentional about mindset. Be intentional about the purpose of your public engagement. Um, be in intentional about the purpose of going in and asking people for their time. Make sure people understand what it is you're looking for uh, and ask them what they might be looking for from you. So again, this is a reciprocal relationship. Communication is really key. You also wanna make sure that you're communicating purpose and how empowered communities will be to make decisions. So don't bring people around the table and ask their opinions on how something should be developed or implemented when in the end they might not have the power to do so. So being really intentional about communicating purpose. Be intentional about recruitment. So when we're thinking about getting people together and hearing what they think about things, whatever the purpose is, we want to make sure uh, that the people around the table are reflective of what the community looks like. That means going to where people are, meeting them where they are, both physically in their neighborhoods, but also from a mental space. What do they need to come to the table and be a part of public life? Is it childcare? Is it food? 
and compensate people for their time. Sometimes budgets are limited, but even a meal can go a long way to saying, I respect you and I value your time. So being intentional about recruitment is not just saying I need to check the box and have all of these types of people at the table, but it's welcoming them, going to their space, and letting them know that you value their time and efforts. Being intentional about design is also really important. So whatever engagement process you want to um, you know, have, whether it's a one-way exchange of information or a two-way exchange or something that's deliberative, be intentional about designing spaces for that type of interaction. Uh, so Jorge talked a lot about the structure of meetings in the school board and how the school board sits up here, the executive council sits up here, and the people are down below. That's not a good design if you want to have participation and engagement. So be really aware of the physical space you're setting up, the design of that space, and also the process in which you're going to engage people. Does that process, does that design serve the goals of the meeting? And finally, um, be intentional about the use of data that is collected from community engagement. Collect it, report it back, and let people know what you did with it, right? So don't keep bringing people to the table, extracting information, and disappearing. That's not how relationships are built. Uh, and those you know, communities don't want to keep showing up when they're not seeing what's being done with their time, which is really valuable. So just to sum it up, collaboration moves at the speed of trust. Be really intentional about building relationships and trust and being in the room, not just when there's a crisis or a problem, but being in the room to celebrate, to have fellowship, uh, and to build community. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Julia. Brian. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to, how to follow that, maybe because um, you hit all the points, but maybe I'll try. Yeah. To just I, maybe I'll try to get tactical with it. Right? I think that's perfect. So, um, so you know, I, you, I, I, can I just have that list? <laughs> Could we like? I'll write it up. That'd be awesome. Because yeah. I, I think that everyone should have that list on their on their desk, like as a reminder. Um, one of the things we did early on was we actually set our values, our public engagement values, and we talked about this a little bit at our table that you know, at its heart, engagement is a value exchange. And so um, ensuring that, you know, the folks that are not just in the community, but also in government value engagement, right? And um, as a community, there's a, I mean, how exciting that you have the opportunity to really shape your future. This community is shaping your future. and. Um, and so being thoughtful throughout the next year and a half that the value exchange is on the table, right? Um, and as you, as you think about that value exchange at every level, um, you know, I've met some folks that work in Parks and Rec, and I've met some folks, oh, this is, I'm talking to my government colleagues now, I've met some folks in emergency management, and I've met some folks in civic life, you know, everyone has the opportunity to reach out to your colleagues. There is no, there's no barrier to picking up the phone and calling your colleagues. Um, if you think that there is a connection with the work you're doing with the work that someone else is doing, pick up the phone. If you think that there's a, um, a stakeholder that is benefit or burdens from your work, pick up the phone or send an email or set up a coffee. Um, if you think that um, you know, there is an opportunity to connect the dots, I used to work at the United States Department of Transportation. I led all the engagement there um, in the Obama administration, and I used to say my job was to connect the dots across the dot. Get it? D-O-T. <laughs> Anyways, OK. So uh, <laughs> um, I don't have a good saying for that in Arlington. Like so, but, you know, but the concept of, of building connections it's all of us, right? And so, you know, Darlene, you know like a thousand people, and Linda, you know a thousand people, and you probably know people that have common interests, so connect, right? And so don't be, sh like don't wait for someone else to build the connection and to bring people to the table. Um, and so, and that's the same in government too, right? So I think when you think through that all the way through, it just reinforces all those points that, um, that you bring. 
And, um, and I would just say that, uh, you know, some of this stuff that's come up this week could be implemented tomorrow. You know, making it easier to access, um, you know, putting out, you know, to neighborhoods the active, um, you know, upcoming engagements that are happening. Uh, you know, getting in front of, um, you know, sharing information and news, uh, maybe even if it's just a couple hours before you make the big announcement. Or, you know, like all the stuff that communications to thread um, that also builds trust. And like we have this challenge um, in Arlington that sometimes, you know, there's a black hole, like, you know, lots of engagement and then it takes years to get funded, you know, and then we're back in design. like continuous kind of connection of the life cycle of projects, of plans, of policies. Um, and so, um, you know, trying to figure out how to, how, to, how to create that. And this is a journey. We haven't figured it all out. We're still figuring it out. Um, I've learned so much being here from you all. Um, I'm taking a lot back with me. And so I'm just thrilled to be a part of this three-day conversation and meet so many people in Portland, and I hope I have the opportunity to come back someday. So thank you very much, and, and go get them. That's what I have to say. <laughs> Thanks, Bryna. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, will, I, will, I will continue adding to what you, to what you said. Um, I, I, would, I would like to first express my gratitude also for this incredible space, uh, Wendy, and all your team. You have done an incredible job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The, the discussion was so diverse. I, I heard so many different stories, all of them valuable, all of them very smart. Um, every person, and this is important, had the time to speak. You know, it was not pressure. That was wonderful also. So, so thanks. I was, I was going to say what I was thinking when listening to, to Brenna, that as we think about public engagement, we can't forget that whenever we participate, when we are participate, participants, we are in some sort of way representatives of other people. We are representing other people. I will give you a simple example. I am flying to Colombia this afternoon, and I, in the airplane, I will be thinking about Portland. Well, you gave me a representation of Portland. Mm. So for me, for Felipe, Portland is you. You've been represented, and, th and I think that Portland is wonderful because you represented Portland for me in this meeting. That's very important from the point of view of responsibility, also when we are participating. When we are participating, we're, when we are involving in a, in, a, in a community engagement project, we are representing other people in a more informal vein, in a more informal way than our usual political representation. So I wanted to say that. I want to say also, Wendy, that I have the impression and I, before, I would like to say that I came here as an expert, but I learned more. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from, from you, more even than I think that I could, that I could say here or I could, I, could, I could teach in some sort of way. So the first, the first thing I would like to say, Wendy, is that my impression is that there is a lot of space in Portland to doing something very interesting, something very innovative in, from the point of view of participatory engagement. I see the potential of this place for really doing something great and something new, uh, something that could be admired in other places of the country and maybe in other places of the world. So I really encourage you to follow that, uh, that, that track. The second, the second thing, and I was thinking in one of the of the of the murals that you that you painted, is that we have to think in a in a systemic perspective. So, for example, the Portland Engagement Project. This is one part of the Portland Engagement Project, but other part could be another different kind of spaces. We have to think in systems of participation, not just one one moment, three days. We have to think in how to articulate different mo moments. 
And I think that in that system, some kind of, 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 of deliberation based in random selection and lotteries could have a space. And it would, very, would be very interesting, Wendy, to think uh, about this. I, I, I only could stay in Portland uh, two nights because I have a, a baby, a one-year-old baby uh, in Bogota. Uh, uh, but I will come back with him. It's a place. It's a place where I would like Alejandro to to know Portland and to to come back here and 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 to 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 be in the in this wonderful city. So thank you very much. We look forward to welcoming him. <laughs> you know, as I sit here at this table and I was listening to everyone else, I'm looking up and I'm in awe of both the symbolism and the lived experiences of reading each of the flags mm. of the different tribes throughout Oregon. Mm. And I'm thinking about, you know, my pastor similarly likes to say, some, he uses the term unity um, without uniformity. And I'm thinking about how here has there has been created a safe space for indigenous peoples from all over to work together to play together to commune together and that and that applies to community engagement in regard to how honoring plurality and this is the kind of the, the, the one reflection I'd like to share, but honoring plurality is just the beginning. Honoring plurality is just the start. When that plurality is a part of the decision-making process of those decisions that most impact them is where we need to end up and where we need to continuously be. So, on that note, <laughs> you've been listening to all of us. We would like to hear from you on your reflections from today. We have another mic right here. And just like, just, just free flowing and just as you're thinking about some of the things you've been thinking about, if you've, if you've had the opportunity to attend all three days or two of the days or just today, what are some of the reflections you may have? And feel free to come up and, and share. Please. Does that mic move around the room? Well, and as a person who does not like to be demanded to reflect on the spot, <laughs> um, you, all, you may um, email us at any point with reflections, if, um, and we'll make sure that you have our contact information before you go so that there's no, um, there's no pressure. Oh, there's no pressure. <laughs> As Grace walks up here, um, I'd like to just acknowledge, I was going to do this later, but I'm going to do it now, um, some incredible people in the, in the room. Felipe has um, referred to Healthy Democracy. They have information over there. They're doing some of the most interesting um, work in the country. Um, Paul Leisner has a really important paper that's based on the work of, of Portland. Um, his materials are there. And of course, our friends at Pregame will um, have their uh, materials there as well. So please um, you know, take a chance to visit with them uh, before you leave. So um, Grace. Uh, just before this closing session, I was talking with Damon about my own personal life experience and what brought me here. And I thought back to a time when I had babies and they and and like Alejandro it's hard to be away from them at, at a certain point in time and um, I was reflecting on the the mural that Claire submitted online about making sure to remember to include people who can't show up at a meeting as easily who have people that they care for at home who have elders or people that they are taking care of and that the evening meeting or the you know the the, so creating online space and, and remembering the people who are w with us online is also really important. This, the, during COVID, I was able to participate in professional associations and in professional development opportunities that had been unavailable to me until I could do them from home. Mm. And so 
keep that in mind too, that not everyone is gonna show up in the room every time, but there's gotta be multiple ways to participate. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Grace. Hi there. Uh, I'm Paul Leisner, and I want to also echo the thanks to our panelists and our speakers and everybody here in the room. This has been a wonderful, very Portland-like uh, conversation. I think this is one of the rare places in the world where people have this energy and passion around this work, and I know there are other places. Okay. Arlington, obviously, I found out that Arlington uh, is sort of should be a sister uh, community for us to learn from each other because they're doing some really innovative stuff. I just wanted to let you know, uh, uh, Wendy mentioned this paper and some colleagues and I did a, a report entitled, this is at PSU, Building Local Government Capacity for Community Engagement, a survey of the field of practice in Oregon. And it's a big meaty report that has all sorts of best practices, theory stuff, but then really digs into what's happening around Oregon, big communities, small communities, and what are the truths that are emerging about what makes this work work uh, all over the state. And so what we have over there is it just the elements of a robust community engagement program and culture. Uh, that's just an excerpt from that report. I think it echoes a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today. But also I think uh, uh, Brian and I were talking about how interesting it would be to go through and look at Portland and look at Arlington and see how many of these things are we already doing. And there are communities across Oregon that are doing amazing work. So I just want to let you know that's over there. And I don't know if we can post the report to, if there's a website You're an for this. intellectual property. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. We can we can definitely link to it through our, if you're willing, if you'd like yeah. to do that, we can definitely link to it. Because it really gets into how do you change the willingness and ability of local government leaders and staff to actually partner in an adult-adult relationship with the community. And training programs are just a very small piece of it. There's so many other elements that start to shape how government people think about us in the community. And so I think you'll find it, uh, I hope you will, a uh, very interesting report. So I'll Thanks. make Thank it available. Yes, please. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. I want to add on to what you had to say, Paul. Um, for any of us that have taken a civics class or gotten your master's in public administration, we know that citizens are on top of our organizational chart. So my heart kind of hurts when we talk about getting our bureaucracy to do civic engagement. And when we should be the ones demanding that they do civic engagement, because don't ever forget, we're at the top of government. We, the citizens, are at the top of government. And we should be pushing, if we feel that our government is not engaging appropriately, we need to stand on that and do something about it. And I honestly feel that if we came together here, we can have a large voice in saying, this is how we expect citizen engagement to work. This is what citizen engagement is. Because we are the citizens. We have the power. And we should not be giving that up to government entities because they hold the power of the purse, so to speak. But we have the voice. And we're the ones in charge. So I don't think we should ever forget that in this democracy. We rule. Thank you, Darlene. I want to respect the time of our um, interpreters online and in the room. And I know that we've, um, that they have been um, told that they are free to enjoy the sunshine at 1.30. So um, um, I would like to um, invite, um, Michael Montoya uh, to the podium to talk about what's next for the city. Um, Michael, the, this is his, um, his child, this, this summit. I'm here to talk about thank yous first and then a little bit about next steps. I am just today, uh, a resident of the city of Portland. I'm not uh, speaking in any official capacity, just to be clear on that. Uh, a bunch of people to thank, um, most of all, you. 
Those of you who came, those of you who are listening, those of you who are watching this sometime later, those of you who day in and day out care enough to show up and to talk with one another and to attempt to do something otherwise. Those of you who care and hold that hope and that spark and that fire to actually make Portland the city that we want it to become. And we're always in the, in the process of becoming a, a, a cooler, weirder, wackier, more effective and functional city. And it's because of the work that you all do. I wanna thank our people uh, who have been helping us with our AV. I wanna thank our interpreters. I want to thank the Native American Student Resource Center. I'm sure I got that name wrong. Um, I want to thank our translators. Um, I want to thank um, Wendy for our, being our MC. I want to thank our guests who flew in from uh, far and wide. I want to thank our local presenters, I think everybody in this room could probably have sat on this panel mm -hmm. and we would have learned a lot from every single one of them. I want to plug something I've been chasing Paul Leisner for a long time, the report. I want us to all read, study, and enact what's in that report because a couple of years in the field doing good research can save you decades of time, effort, and conflict in the real world. And so thank you, Paul, for doing that work and for assembling that labor of love for us in not only this community, but throughout the state. Appreciate that. Um, uh, I wanna thank Pregame, who's been conducting our listening sessions for our city employees, as well as all over Portland, in our neighborhoods and online. I wanna thank the Center for Public Service. I wanna thank Oregon's Kitchen Table. I wanna thank Portland State. I wanna thank the Hatfield School. I wanna thank uh, Damon from the No Agenda Foundation, who was critical in helping us design this summit in a way that was as accessible as we could make it. Was it perfect? No, but it was real and it was good. So thank you, Damon, for that work. I want to thank our neighborhood associations whose tenacity and pluck was the driving force behind trying to do something and imagine a different form of engagement. I want to thank our neighborhood level activists and all the nonprofits in the city of Portland who also helped push us forward. Um, I want to thank Civic Life. What a wonderful bunch of folks. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. They've been around each time. Amazing. I want to thank the Center for Public Impact that has been working on a 10-week intensive with city engagement professionals inside the city of Portland to help them come up with capstone projects which will help inform how the city staff who do engagement think about and can be um, co-opted? No, joined with in the, the future of what we imagine public and participatory engagement can actually be. Um, I often say that one of the truest tests of an engagement system is the quality of the relationships that it enables. If it enables affirmation, collaboration, respect, cooperation, dialogue, um, uh, uh, and, and, and care, we're on the right track. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Um, I um, want to thank the city of Portland, the city council, past, current and future leaders. And that leads me to what my hope is for what we might all do with these wonderful uh, ideas. Not just what we heard in this three-day summit, but what the Center for Public Impact and the 10-week intensive, but also pre-games work in the listening, listening sessions and the conversations that will continue, hopefully, for months and months to come. I think of this as a moment where all of these lessons will be combined and they will begin to germinate and hopefully they will pollinate and they will begin to percolate and stew and like a good mole it takes time to, to, for all the wonderful insights to gel so that when you pick it up, it's like, yes, that's it. So there will be some time where we won't see much from our labors over the past year. But when we do, there will be hopefully a very wonderful foundational uh, maybe not roadmap, but foundational wellspring of ideas that aren't just ours in our echo chamber of Portland, aren't born of the conflict of misunderstanding, but are born of the hope and the aspiration and the respect and affirmation of all of the work that each one of you brought here today. That's my hope for what will happen, and I want to thank you all so much 
uh, for uh, your participation today. And again, special thanks to Oregon's Kitchen Table and to you, Wendy. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Michael. Um, yeah, as you, as you all know, appreciations are the currency of Oregon's Kitchen Table, so, and Michael covered so many of those appreciations. Um, and I just want to echo them. I really, um, one of the things that we do, my, our kids love to play this game of um, tracing back where our conversation started. So you like, we find ourselves talking about the Electoral College, but we started out talking about chicken soup. And they'll go, first we talked about this, then we talked about that, and then we talked about this. And I, I, have, like, I have this feeling as we leave today, like all these conversations that are spinning out of this room, um, not just here in Portland, but now around the world, and that we'll trace back all these um, more democratic spaces to this conversation, and the conversation yesterday, and the conversation before that, and the conversations that pregame um, led to, and the conversations that are happening, the brave conversations that are happening inside the city. And um, I just, it just gives me um, warmth to think about that, um, democracy being um, spun out from this room. And I think we heard a lot about healing, a lot about healing um, over the last few days. And, and I just um, appreciate us being able to take that forward, saying sometimes we don't know what to do, that, um, that connecting to each other, listening to each other, um, and um, acting in solidarity, as we saw uh, m uh, many times up there, it, it is what we can do. So um, I appreciate you all. I appreciate the, um, my goodness, the hours and hours and hours and hours of work that, came, that, um, ha that happened here. And as always, I pre offer appreciations both public and privately to one another. And uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>